My name is Jacob Mullins. I'm CEO and founder of a company called Exit Round. Um, Exit Round is a software platform for mergers and acquisitions. So I'll get into the product itself, but before we do that, I just want to talk a little about M&A, generally where it's at today, um, and go from there. And then we'll do Q&A towards the end. Um, that's a quick agenda. So as you've probably noticed, the world of mergers and acquisitions has been on fire for the past. 2015 was one of the largest uh, years of all time. Around $3.2 billion worth of acquisitions happened. Um, a lot of tech majors um, buying. Uh, a weak IPO market um, leads to a lot more M&A. Um, out of the 2007-2008 uh, kind of economic cycle, a lot of companies reduced their R&D and spending. Um, and, and as they came out of that into 2012, 2013, 2014, they realized that their, their uh, companies needed to be able to, uh, to grow new business lines and, and basically take the money that they weren't spending on research and development and focus it on M&A. So, uh, and then the third trend is essentially software is eating the world, right? So now you have clothing companies and construction companies and everyone's becoming a software company. So those three trends have been going on that have been fueling a lot of the M&A uh, deals that we've seen. Um, I'm going to talk about three, three representative examples to kind of help, help frame your, your mind on this. So Exact Target was purchased by Salesforce for $2.5 billion. Um, you can kind of see some of the stats about this, but the point was this was a very large existing business. Um, this was a business that Salesforce wanted to tack onto their business as they continued to grow their different service offerings. Um, and, and they were able to pay up, and Salesforce paid up for it because it was a market leader. Let's talk about Nest. Um, Nest was a $3.2 billion acquisition. Nest was revolutionary in its space. Um, they weren't the market leader by any stretch, but they were coming out of very, very, very large market um, with a revolutionary uh, solution, and they were acquired uh, for a sizable uh, amount. So th th consider this kind of the disruptive business uh, where, where exact target would be the market leader business. Uh, and then let's look at WhatsApp, which is just the most stratospheric uh, deal ever, $19 billion. Um, and this was bought for, because of their tremendous engagement, um, hundreds of millions of people connecting multiple times a day. Um, this was an, an engagement acquisition. And so if you look at the three next to each other, Exact Target, which was a freestanding business, uh, you look at Nest, which was a disruptive technology, and then you look at WhatsApp, you can see uh, in, in, these, in these three examples that acquirers were really interested to pay up for engagement because they thought they could take those people and move them into different parts of their business. So let's talk, um, oh, I kind of, this is what I was covering. So this is kind of multiples that these companies were getting um, in order to get those. Now let's talk about the overall tech landscape. Um, the overall tech landscape is, is different. So this is where those big deals happen in the, 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 the spike. Um, but 88% of deals in early stage technology get purchased under $100 million. They're in that long tail. Um, and that's the area that I focus on, essentially, and that exit round focuses on. Um, and if you think about it, you know, nine out of 10 are gonna end up sub $100 million. You know, it's just good to start thinking about what the opportunities are for M&A for your business. Um, and Gil and a lot of investors will tell you about raising money, and raising money is important. But as you think about building your business, you should also be thinking about what are the M&A options uh, across the board. And oftentimes, those aren't conversations that you're going to just strike up overnight. Um, and it's not, it's, it's rarely a large company coming in and throwing a bunch of money at you. It's most of the time, it's relationships built over time. And so as you build your business, think about building relationships with large companies as you go along. Um, and the point is, even if the deal's under $100 million, it doesn't mean you can't make money. Uh, it means you can make actually a tremendous amount of money, and in most cases, you're returning that money directly to, uh, to the owners of the company or the early angels. So we did a study called, uh, we, well, just the exit curve. Um, you can get it at exitround.com slash data, and we pulled together data from uh, Y Combinator, Techstars, 500 Startups, Founder Institute, um, basically looking at all the exit data over the past 10 years. And we realized that just because you raise more money doesn't mean you're gonna sell or you're gonna exit for a larger sum of money. And there were some representative peaks and troughs in there um, between seven and 10 million, for example, and then between 25 and 30, where you were kind of, uh, those companies representatively did not exit for, uh, for larger sums, but if they raised on either side of it, they did. Um, I'd, I'd urge you to look into this report. It's a 20-page report. Um, it's free. You can download it, xaround.com slash data, to get more insight into, um, into what's going on and the reality of, of M&A. So, um, you know, like we talked, M&A is reaching stratospheric heights. Um, as Gil was saying, I, the IPO market is relatively bogged down. There haven't been a lot of good exits. And so, um, you know, when you think about 
how the M&A market's gonna continue to shape up, we see buyers continuing to be excited. They're gonna buy for disruptive new products, they're gonna buy new business lines, and they're gonna buy for engagement. Um, so think about you know, which, which, which bucket your companies fit into. Um, let's see, so some of the M&A targets that we see today, this is kind of where, what we're seeing, um, and it's an interesting stat. There's nearly $900 billion in cash sitting in the top 25 companies uh, in tech majors. Um, they're going to be reinvesting that into product, but also buying new businesses. And Salesforce is just a great example of that. Um, so, you know, as you think about, again, which type of company you're going to build, think about are you going to be that disruptive company, are you building the engaging company, are you building the actual freestanding business? Um, there's a lot of reasons you'd want to do one or the other, um, but keep that, keep that thought in mind. Um, so these are types of deals. Now we're going to get a little into kind of M&A mechanics a little bit. I'm not sure. How many of you guys have gone through an M&A process before? Okay, a handful. Um, so what we're seeing in the market today are three types of acquisitions. One is certainly a value acquisition. Those are over $100 million. Those are billion dollar deals. Um, we see asset and IP solutions, people trying to sell um, the assets that they've built. And then kind of on the lowest end, we see team hires or aqua hires, and we can talk a lot about that as well. Um, you know, as an entrepreneur and what you, as, as you think about exiting your business, you have to think about what are your perspectives and what's your goal from this. Um, in some cases, the goal may be, well, you're out of money, so you got to figure out how to land the company. Uh, and, or it may be you just are at the top of the market, you're doing well, and it's a good time to sell the business and get, get a multiple on your valuation. Um, excuse me. So when you go into an M&A conversation, you want to oftentimes have your priorities in mind. What, what are your priorities? Is it, uh, is it the optics of a win? Do you want to be able to put on LinkedIn that you were acquired? And Actually, that's quite valuable as well as you start to think about your next thing or your next business. Do you want to return cash to your investors? Do you want to return cash to your employees? Do you want to uh, land them and get them jobs? Um, all of these are really important to have in your mind at the outset of thinking about M&A because that's going to determine how the structure of the liquidity event is actually going to happen and come down. So be very open and clear with, your, uh, with the other side, the buyers, if you're interested in one of these or the other. Now, the VC incentive um, is essentially, you know, it's return on, on, on investment, and different types of investors have different uh, perspectives. So angel and seed funds often in their business model are investing little bits, as you know, in, lar in a larger amount of companies, whereas a venture investor may be investing a larger amount of money in a fewer number of companies. So their incentives for returning capital and the incentives for the M&A process are very different. Um, where a venture investor will spend a lot of time and money bringing in bankers to make sure that they can recoup their investment within seed funds with large portfolios. Um, oftentimes, you know, it's part of the model to be able to exit or not exit um, or kind of roll that, money, roll that money back in. So think about what, where your investors are at, what their incentives are, and be very clear with them. Um, and then you really got to understand the needs of the buyer. And you know, that's the biggest thing. And one of the things that, that I've learned about being in the M&A business is that while fundraising may be, there may be a market for fundraising, you can have a, value, a certain valuation that different investors will, uh, will subscribe to. In M&A, the business is worth nothing until someone is interested in paying for it. Um, and unless you get someone on the hook who's willing to write a check, the business is worthless. And unfortunately, we see this very often. So focus on getting a buyer to the table. What you want to do is get one buyer to the table, and around that, you can bring other buyers and build a process around that. Um, and so when you start talking to buyers, and oftentimes some of your best buyers are your partners or your competitors. They're people who actually know the value of the business, how hard it is to build the entrenched moat that you've built. They know the value of your product. And so think about those competitors or partners as people that if you want, that you would want to start to build a relationship over time so that you can move into an M&A discussion with them if you need. And really get to understand what their incentives are. Um, if it's a competitor or a partner, it's, it's probably a tack on business. If it's a large company like a Google or a Facebook, are they interested in buying for the, to build a new business unit? Are they interested in putting your technology solution into their existing unit? Or are they looking for the expertise from your team that they can put in? Um, and, and as you start to understand that early on, you're gonna get a sense of what the valuation multiples look like for the company and, and for your own M&A activity. Um, this is kind of just expectations of a process. Um, it's, it's pretty straightforward. 
Um, you know, when the time is right, again, you'll want to go out and start that conversation. You're going to start having conversations. And again, once you have one kind of straw man buyer, one buyer who's interested, then you go out and you hit the market hard. And you try to bring as many buyers around that process as possible. Similar to fundraising, right? You want to kind of create competition. Um, and that's what you're going to want to do with, uh, with an M&A process as well. Um, and do not count your chickens before they hatch. Don't start imagining that yacht. Don't start imagining the golf course you've been playing on. Um, these things fall apart at the last minute all the time. So not until you have the signed, you have the signed closed definitive agreement um, are you really in, in, a, in a safer spot. So let's, I'll just kind of tell you a little about our product, which is called ExitRound.com. It's a software platform for mergers and acquisitions. We have uh, around 4,000 selling companies on one side. We have around 10,000 buy-in companies on the other. And in the middle of that network, there's a software recommendation algorithm that helps match buyers and sellers and surface deals for each other. Um, so what we've built, what we call is Genome. Um, and Genome is a content-based recommendation engine. Um, it's actually built, architected similar to how Pandora is built with a number of features we extract on each company. Um, so as a seller, you essentially build out a profile of what your company does. You do not include the company names or people's names in order to keep privacy and confidentiality. And we use NLP to, come to, to pull, extract features from the company and then find relevant match, uh, matches on the buy side. Um, so this is just a kind of visual example, but essentially you can put your company in, it's going to churn, uh, it's going to provide you in real time uh, suggested buyers for your particular business. So a lot of people use it um, when they do get that one interested buyer, they start having a conversation, they'll come into exit round and they'll start to see what other buyers may be interested um, in order to, to create competition for the, for the conversation. This is an example, I'll show you. Uh, sure, you can ask a question now. Uh, do you have any arbitration engine in the previous? Yep, yep. arbitration engine, what do you mean by that? Okay. Uh, buyer, seller, buy side, sell side, yep. the platform is there. Yep. Would you have an arbitration engine in terms of I want this, I don't want this? Got but it. For the content class, yep. the fifth level, and then when it comes to if there's a, some kind of a number that can flow. Yep. yep. So, so yeah, yep. the question was, do we help with the kind of pricing and deal, deal arbitration uh, in the platform? And we do not. So the platform is focused on, on surfacing buyers and sellers. And once the buyers and sellers are surfaced, um, we let them connect and have those conversations in their own, in their own way. Um, so this is an example, I'll show you guys, of a company that came in. It was a um, construction equipment e-commerce company. And they were trying to figure out who to sell to, who, who, who could be a potential buyer. Um, Caterpillar was on their list and a few others. Um, and I'll send this deck out after you guys can, can share it. But this is essentially a screenshot of suggested buyers. Now most, in the platform we've done around 85, 90 deals. Uh, and most of those, I'd say all of them except one, have been buyers and sellers that did not know each other before. So if you, you know, as you build your company, and you, you can probably write a list of the top 20 buyers who you think are the best buyers for your company. That's great. Um, you should definitely go approach all of them. But who are the other 80 buyers out there that you don't, you, that you don't know and you haven't thought about? And so that's, that's the results that'll come out for this. So for this e-commerce uh, construction company, it was servicing different rental companies, construction companies, et cetera. Um, and we're gonna provide you data with exactly why that we're, we're recommending that company based on the size of it, the revenue of it, past acquisitions, the location. Um, so you're gonna get insight and then you can reach out to that buyer through the platform and pitch your company to have a, an M&A conversation. Here's just a couple of examples. And you can see how the, the data changes on the right-hand side. Oops. Question? Yes. In the genome disclosure on either side, mm -hmm. whatever genome you want to call it, right? Mm -hmm. um, parameters. How do you make sure you don't disclose too much yep. about the company on both sides, yep. but still create, you know, Yep, so privacy and confidentiality is incredibly important yeah, within yeah. M&A generally, and so we want to keep that within exit round. Correct. So the seller builds the profile. They build the exit round profile, and it's up to the seller to be as vague or as specific as they want to be. So it's... We do not. Um, it, the profile does not have the company's name in it, so it has the characteristics of the company. When the buyer, if there's an interested buyer, they express interest via the platform. They say, I want to learn more information. And the seller gets to approve that request. So the seller will have the opportunity to see 
what buyer is asking the question. So you would get a note that says, Gary from Facebook is interested in connecting on XAround, and ultimately that seller can approve it or decline it. Um, once they approve it, then the veil of anonymity comes off, um, the company name is exposed to the buyer, and then the buyer can, can get a recommendation directly. Um, so yeah, so as you think about you know, M&A and, and, and exiting your business at some point, realizing value for yourself and for your investors, um, this, is a, this is a tool that, that we built, and so you should use it. <laughs> um, so let's just talk about a few, a few things, um, just traits of successful M&A that we've seen. Um, the best time to evaluate an M&A opportunity or whether or not you should do it is when you're going to go fundraise. So you're going to think about, should I, there, it's basically a capital solution one way or the other. Um, and oftentimes it's great to test both markets at, at the same time. You can go to a potential acquirer, and if you have a fundraising term sheet, they may be able to bump up their valuation and vice versa. If you can sell the business and have a term sheet for that, you can oftentimes go back to an investor, a new investor or an existing investor to double down and get more, more money for your business. Um, also, businesses just tend to go through natural peaks and valleys as the markets change, as technology changes. So you may want, you'll want to think about what's the value of your business given today, and if you take that next round of funding, what's that going to look like in two or three years when you go raise your next round? Are you going to be you know, 200 or 300% more valuable then, or are you more valuable now? And these are good conversations to, to, not, you know, to have with your investors, with your advisors, people around you. Lawyers are great people to have this conversation with as well. They have a great view on the market. Certainly, the Jonathans have, have a great view on the market as well. Um, but that's a great time to think about uh, whether or not you should approach M&A. Um, the... the uh, Average time for our buyers and sellers that we've seen in deals is they've known each other for two and three quarters of, a, of years. So they've known each other for three years. Um, the biggest thing in M&A, again, where, f where fundraising is a bit of a, com like a, a competitive process where you can drive in capital, in M&A it's a people business. Um, it's do you get along with that buyer and that, does that buyer really like you, really like your business and willing to spend millions of dollars for your business? Um, and if the two people do not get along, there's no, there's no business going to happen. And so by building a relationship early, as I was saying, with your partners, your competitors, potential buyers, let them see you build your company. Let them see you build your company over three years and watch how, how you develop product and how you come to market and how you're successful. Because if and when you want to go and actually approach an M&A conversation with them, you're in very known quantity. Um, We've seen that after the business is four years old, there's been an increase of M&A value, and that kind of makes sense, right? If your business has been around for four years, you've probably figured out some sort of a business, um, or you've been able to raise capital around that. Um, and the number one thing is basically you, you need to find your internal champion at the buyer company. Um, if you think Facebook's going to buy you, um, Facebook literally gets 400 inbound M&A requests a day. That they're a team of four people, and they, they handle 400 requests of people saying, hey, do you want to buy, buy my business a day? So that's not a very likely story. The best way to do it, if you, if, if you think Facebook's your best partner, is go find the product managers. Go find the GMs of the business units that your product fits into and become best friends with them, and become best friends with them over a three-year period of time. So if and when it's time to consummate an M&A deal, you can go to them. You're a known quantity. You have an internal champion who is not the corp dev person. The corp dev person basically does the paperwork, is the facilitator of the process. But the corp dev person is not the one that pounds the table and makes, uh, makes a case for why they should buy your business. So find an internal champion. Um, again, those are people on the product or engineering side, typically. Um, when you go into an M&A process, uh, you're going to want to have all of your, uh, your documents prepared and ready. Um, the biggest thing that kills M&A deals is time. Uh, if you let time, if, if a buyer is interested and they're going to go out and make a purchase, oftentimes the next week, by the next week, sometimes priorities have changed. Um, or sometimes there's funding that gets moved around. Or maybe the market crashes in a certain way and the buyer's not interested anymore. There are a million reasons why not to buy a company. So if you go after a process, if you go out for a process, make sure you have all your documents in line, your financials in line. Literally put them into a Dropbox. And if there's an interested buyer, invite them to that Dropbox so that you don't have to do any more. Um, so they can do their internal reviews, they can do their internal, um, their internal valuations, and they'll come back to you with a term sheet as quickly as possible. And you know, what, what to expect is, is 
it is a very people-driven business. You know, you have to, it's almost like falling in love and getting married uh, with the new company. Because what that buyer is thinking is, not only are we going to take this product and plug it into our company, but they're thinking about how does this affect our business for the next two years? How, where does this team physically sit? Who are the managers of this, of this actual team? And integration is actually a huge headache. Um, some companies, Google is historically not good at integrations. Twitter, very good at integrations. Um, and again, that's a people business. It's how organized are they? How, Salesforce is very good at it. Um, and so, you know, you're going to have to help, help the buyers get over this, um, get kind of make those thoughts, um, make the plan, and you're going to want to help, help them make that plan. Um, uh, let's see. And then, you know, kind of think about, you know, again, when is the right time? And... You want to optimize for success. You want to have the right people who you think would buy your business um, on, that know you. You want to be able to have multiple conversations around you. Um, and you want to have that conversation with your investors to figure out when, when is the right time. Um, oops. What are we seeing in, for M&A in, in 2016 is, and we're kind of almost through 2016, it's been a slower year for M&A than 2015. Um, that doesn't mean that their deals are still not happening. There are still a lot of deals happening. Um, it's just been a little bit slower. On the aqua hire side, we've seen less. Um, we've seen less talent acquisitions. Um, historically, they don't work super well, or they haven't worked super well, and some of that is um, the, the, again, falling apart in integrations. Um, uh, people are not buying engineers, trying to put butts in seats. Um, if they do make an acquisition, buyers are looking for companies where there's a super strong product overlap. Um, so you need, you know, the business that you've been working on needs to fit in directly, and those people need to have direct experience in, in, that, in that business for the buyer. Um, and, you know, just some predictions. We expect VC valuations to come down. We expect capital to be a little tighter. Um, we s expect a lot of seed investment and angel investment to continue to increase. So that means more startups. Um, traditional venture in Series A's and B's hasn't changed over the past few years. So, so there's more companies coming down the pipe. The pipe is the same size. Um, so you're going to have to think about, you know, is M&A actually a part of that strategy? Um, and, uh, and, and oftentimes in deals of this size, it's a good deal for, for again, for owners and for, um, for investors. And a little bit of what we're seeing, so our, our network of buyers and sellers, as you can imagine, produces a tremendous amount of data. Um, we're able to look at what buyers from large companies are looking for and searching for, and we're able to provide them leads of businesses interested in M&A. Um, and so this is some of what we're seeing. We're seeing content businesses and content models are really interesting. Um, the monetization of them are tricky, um, but there's a lot of interest from old media to be able to, to, to modernize, take in UGC, um, and, and uh, the BuzzFeed type businesses. There's a huge interest in data science and machine learning. Um, you know, big data was the trend of five years ago and now everybody has all this data they're, they're storing but they don't know what to do with it. Um, and so people are thinking through how do you, how do you actually crunch that? Um, so looking for machine learning teams. And then mobile. Mobile is just across the board the most important, uh, the most important platform these days and there's a lot of interest from buyers. Um, we're seeing demand from businesses that make money um, so, so in exit round, about 20% of the buyers are actually private equity firms. Not venture firms, they're, but they're more traditional private equity firms. What they're looking for are cash flowing businesses that are doing between 500,000 in revenue a year and 10 million in revenue a year. And if your business fits in there, there are private equity firms that are interested in acquiring your business as a profitable business and growing it themselves. Um, we're ca we call that nano private equity because it's such a small end of the market, but it's oftentimes a good exit for, um, for early stage entrepreneurs who've been at it for five to 10 years and are looking for an exit option that, you know, in, in a revenue generating case. Um, we see weakening demand for design and, and media distribution, um, but uh, yeah, that's kind of what we're seeing today. And then go to xround.com slash data. There's a lot, of, a lot of information about M&A there. And... That's kind of the prepared remarks I had. Awesome, a lot of hands. Uh, what about cross-border? Do you have any cross-border listing? Cross-border international. Yeah, so we have, um, we have companies for sale in 85 different countries, so it is cross-border. Buyers um, are mostly US-based. Um, there have been a couple of deals in the UK. Um, the, most active, uh, the most active selling areas are, or, or interest are... Um, are Southeast Asia, um, China, uh, the UK, and then, and then the US. 
Uh, but there are businesses in Brazil and, and all over the place. So. Uh, from the most active uh, buyers in your platform, can you roughly say you like the percentage between enterprise buyers and just private companies? That's a good question. Breakdown of enterprise buyers or what type, what's the buyer set look like? Um, I would say actually the most active ones are actually non-tech buyers. I call them legacy buyers. Um, they would be like a Westfield Mall or Fender Guitar or Red Bull. Um, there are these large companies that are worth billions and hundreds of billions of dollars and they're realizing they need to have technology within their business stack in order to reach customers or market or whatever it is. You know, every, every piece of the business is being, uh, in, in, being changed. So we do, the buyers in here, are, we do have Google and Facebook and all the big guys and they're active, but the ones that find most success from it are, are the non-tech buyers. That is also because those, the technical guys already have some uh, big deal flow uh, incoming? Yeah, definitely. Um, Google has 24 corp dev people. They're set up for, for processing acquisitions. Um, they have 12 divisions. They have two people per division, and they just churn through it. Each company has a different flavor. Like I said, Facebook is a very small team um, who gets a ton of inbound leads. Um, you're right, non-tech buyers, the legacy buyers, they're not set up for acquisitions of tech companies, at least. Um, so oftentimes, that means the process will go a little bit slower. You're going to have to bring them up to speed. Um, you know, having a, an attorney on their side who has done small kind of early stage tech deals is important or else, um, or else a lot of things can get bogged down. So, yes, Jonathan. Uh, so, Jacob, in terms of plugging your, uh, your platform, are you now able to buy tranches of stock as opposed to a whole uh, selling? Can you actually find a buyer who's willing to take a 20% position? Is, is, that, is that possible on your that's platform? Good, that's a good question. Um, because of SEC regulations, we're not able to sell securities. Um, so the, the X around operates under what's called an M&A broker license. An M&A broker is someone who can facilitate the sale of majority stake of companies. Um, if we were to offer selling us a, a minority stake, um, that would be a sale of securities. We'd have to be a registered broker dealer, which we're not. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so, so we're an M&A broker. So we don't do that. If, however, you, you connect on the platform and the purposes of M&A, and that buyer actually just wants to end up buying a 20% stake, at that point, it's a conversation between the two parties we're no longer involved. So maybe that can happen, uh, but we wouldn't be in the loop. In the past, you said you were going to start kind of pushing that, because that's an amazing feature that a lot of maybe startups should take advantage of, no? Yeah. yeah. Um, certainly, I mean, you'd consider those like strategic investors, essentially, large corporates who are interested in buying in the space. So, um, so yeah. I mean. It's, X around is very M&A focused, but what it also is, is a great way to, be, to meet large companies who are interested in your space. So think about them as partners. So you can, you know, for example, Dave Cohen at, at Techstars on twice a year, he's one of our investors, sends, sends out to it to the whole Techstars list and says, hey, if you're not, a, if you're not on exit round, you should be. It's a great way to meet customers and partners. Um, so if you put your company up there and Westfield Mall comes, comes and strikes up a conversation, go try to sell them something first. Not the business, just go try to sell them a contract for something. Um, and down the line, maybe it'll turn into an acquisition, but it's a great way of, of doing business development as well. Final ending uh, kind of sub-question is, uh, do you have any kind of analogy or what percentages of the companies that, do they end up doing these side deals? Do you have any kind of analogous information to figure that oh, out? Oh, what? Sorry, I missed that. So let's say um, you, oh, you, you, yeah, so these side deals that basically they don't really take place on your platform, so whether yeah. it's sales or those sorts of things, do you have any sort of data on those benefits? Not really. Our focus is making the introduction between buyers and sellers, so the metrics we look at are um, essentially numbers of matching buyers and sellers, um, rates, conversion rates of actual connections and the speed of those connections. We call it investment banking automation, and we have an example, actually a real life example, where we had a, a mobile, um, a just like a, a mobile uh, document sharing company come in to sell. And they built a profile, and it recommended that they should connect with Dropbox. And so it automatically fired off notifications to drop the corp dev people at Dropbox, including Drew Houston at Dropbox, who then saw that email, clicked, yes, I want to connect. We saw that, and within four hours, the corp, head of Corp Dev at, corp, uh, at Dropbox was talking to the CEO at the startup. Um, if, you, if you've ever been in a banking process or an M&A process, connecting a buyer and a seller like that usually takes weeks, it takes months. Um, and this happened in a period of four hours. So, um, so once that connection's made, we step out. So I don't have a lot of data on any side deals that happen, um, but yeah. What's your revenue model? So our revenue model is a success fee. Um, so while buyers pay a small, buyers will pay a small monthly fee. 
Um, but other than that, it's a success model. So if the company sells, yeah, if the company sells X around uh, the fee, the buyer pays is one per the greater of 1% or $20,000 per head, depending on how the deal is. So no scale in terms of reverse Lehman, Lehman scale, anything like that? No. Right. Yep, yep, it's a greater of 1% or 20K per, per head, paid by the buyer. That's, a, that's an important part. Yes, yeah. So what is the success rate? Like, if we have a company we want to software enter like what yep. you heard of getting recommended buyers. Yep. yep, good question. So two thirds of company on the platform uh, get at least interest from one buyer. So that means that uh, one third don't get any interest. Um, and that's good data for you as well. Um, but two thirds do get interest. Of those that get interest, they on average they get three buyers who are interested. Um, and that connects. So uh, and, uh, we have 4,000 sellers, active sellers on the platform. Over the past three and a half years, there have been 85, 90 deals that have happened. Um, so you can kind of look at that success rate. M&A um, is a binary business. It, 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 it is, you know, it's, it's hard to, uh, the, the success rates generally are very low. Even if you talk to Goldman Sachs, who's probably the best in the business, 50% of their companies end up selling, 50% don't. Um, and so that's, and they charge a $3 million minimum, exactly, to even touch the company. So, so it's, it's just a, you know, it's a business of um, starting early, making sure you have time, and making as many connections as possible. Do service providers play in your sandbox? We do have some bankers that use it. Um, we do have some bankers that'll use the genome algorithm in order to find buyers for their process. Um, we don't monetize them separately. They just pay the, the monthly fee at this point. Do you have like a, some sort of uh, due diligence on the companies, especially international companies that might sign up and they're just paid for work companies? Or? Yeah, so um, we do screen for quality. Um, so other than privacy and confidentiality, which is number one, the second is quality. Um, we have you know high high priced buyers in our system, and I want to make sure that they're seeing great companies. Um, so every company that applies to sell, we have a team that actually looks through those profiles and screens them for quality. Quality, we mean. A good, like a, a, it, it's a subjective bar, but have they raised money from well-known investors? Have they gone through an incubator? Do they have good connections? We look at the product site. We look at their LinkedIn profiles. We make sure it looks like an actual meaty deal to weed out the ones that are just maybe some paperwork. Um, uh, the, the, the application rate is basically we, we let in 50% and we turn away 50%. So there's a lot of kind of paperwork type companies that we end up filtering out. Um, but I mean, anybody in this room probably has a, a company that would, that could be in there. Um, it, the bar isn't super high, but it's subjective. Mm -hmm. Sir. Yeah, sure. I'll uh, actually send, I did, I sent them to Torrance and Christina, so he, they can share them with you. Yeah, happy to. Good job. Yeah, thank you. A any other questions? Awesome. Oh, yeah. How long have you been with this uh, matchmaking, and how does it improve in time? Yeah, good question. So XAround has been around for three and a half years, started in March 2013. Um, I was not a banker before, so this is kind of my, the experience. Um, uh, the, how does it get better? So the recommendation algorithm works like Pandora. So the more active that you are as a buyer or a seller, it starts to hone and identify the right matches for you. So on the buy side, um, if you go in and as you search and filter, um, for different companies, we take in um, to account time on page. So let's say someone from UPS comes in and they want to buy logistics companies in Cincinnati and they're only looking at companies that are doing under 10 million in revenue. For us, that's going to be an indicator of that's what they're looking for. The more active they are, the more likely our recommendations are going to, or specific our recommendations are going to be for them. Same on the sell side. So as a seller, when you build a profile, um, you're going to go through and we're going to provide recommended buyers for you and the seller is going to be able to, to say fit or not a fit. And every time you do that, like Pandora, we're essentially crunching the, crunching the numbers on the back end to understand what is a fit, what's not a fit, and we start to surface more recommended companies for you that fit that characteristic. The, the most likely determining factor for M&A, other than a personal, strong personal relationship, is just how, how the expectations have been set and how specific the match is. Um, and so if we can make that match you know, highly targeted for companies, geography, um, revenue size, funding amount, as, as targeted as possible, there's a much higher likelihood of a conversation happening from there. How many international players do you have versus domestic? Um, 
It's, it's, I'd say 90, I mean, 90%, uh, yes, yeah, yeah. Why did I start it? Good question. Um, so, uh, I was, like I said, I was at Shasta Ventures, and, you know, M&A is a much more proactive process than I originally thought. Uh, before, when, you know, when you read TechCrunch, you see Facebook, you know, pays $19 billion for something, and you think that's how it's always done. Um, and people are just awash in money. And the reality is, in a boardroom, the investors are often thinking about exiting years in advance. And when, and the CEO is in that conversation as well. Um, and you think about, you know, if let's say you're 18 to 24 months out from raising money, is that going to be an easy fundraise or is that going to be a difficult fundraise? And you think about if it's going to be difficult, what, is it going to get more difficult when you're 12 months out? And at that point, you start thinking, okay, I need to start having M&A conversations. Um, so one, it was a much more proactive process than I'd ever imagined. The second is, um, it's just so intransparent. Like, I had friends who were at Google and Facebook, and they'd say, hey, we're trying to build this thing, we're looking to buy something, and I was like, oh, I just met with a company the other day that was doing that. You guys don't know them? And then I you know, connected the dots, and they ended up doing a small deal. And I realized, even in this small world, M&A is so hush-hush and taboo, you don't talk about it. Um, and so you're, there's a lot of opportunity that's missing there. And so that's where we came at it, if you, you know, with a private marketplace that keeps confidentiality but enables people to have these high-level strategic conversations. Um, it could, it could cr grease the wheels and just be, create a more liquid market um, for M&A, if you will. So, um, so, yeah. What's been your biggest surprise in this industry? The biggest surprise is um, it is a... a it is a dirty business. Um, it is the Wild West. Um, when, you know, especially if a company doesn't have a lot of options, um, the buyer has the opportunity to do nearly anything. Um, and the investors in this and the team need oftentimes to accept that, um, depending on the timing. So that's why start your timing early, start having conversations early, build personal relationships inside the company early. Um, the last thing you want to do is be in a compressed time frame with very few options but one, because that buyer will, um, you know, will be able to, to kind of make it the better deal for them. And, and the second thing is how, um, how, much the human, how much of a human business it is. Like, you know, when you're buying a stock or even investing in a company, you kind of, you look at the market, you look at relative valuations, you calculate what you think the expected value is going to be in five to ten years, and you make your investment. Um, in m and it is, you could do all that, but it's actually the importance of the people, the buyer and the seller sitting across from each other who are, um, you know, going to make this successful or not. It's the people. So, yes, sir. Uh, you may have addressed this. What are your fees if you have a company that you Oh yeah, totally. So the fees are, um, for a buyer, there's a small monthly fee, so it's 50 bucks a month for buyers. The transaction fee... Yeah, exactly. The, the, uh, but it's the main business model is transaction fee, so it's the greater, uh, in the event of a successful transaction, the, it, the, our fee is one, the greater of 1% or $20,000 per head, whichever is the larger fee. Yes, sir? No exclusivity um, on our platform. So um, if the buyer and the seller m meet on our, on our platform and we have the audit trail and the introductions and all that, um, we'll collect our fee, but they can, they're free to work across on, on it with any other introductions as well. And that's where a lot of M&A advisors actually use our software in order to, find, to bring other buyers to the table um, as well. Yes, sir? Who are you displacing through this? I mean, I, I understand that you're not going after the Goldman, but are you going after like the, what is it, certified M&A advisor kind of group that are doing that? Um, yeah. Bill talked about, you know that you're doing it right when you see the cab drivers burning yeah. Ubers. So, yeah. so where, where have you gotten the most pushback? Because this is just fascinating model. Yeah, we're definitely not going after Goldmans of the world. I think <clears throat> our, you know, our naive entrepreneur kind of gusto in year one was, we're gonna eradicate bankers, you know, and, and, and we've learned, no, actually bankers are the most helpful people to, and, and they're the, the best people to use our software and our platform. <clears throat> so now we work with bankers, um, and it's a software that bankers get to use, and that's something we've learned actually over time. <laughs> um, 
I'd say the people that get most threatened are the small, you know, in, individual M&A advisors. The, the individuals or small boutique firms, um, there's an event called, or there's an industry association called ACG, America's Corporate Growth, um, and we were at one event and there was a, a, an independent M&A advisor screaming at me across the table after I told them what I did. So, um, that said, I was like, use the software. It's going to make your business better. Um, so I think that's who we're displacing. Um, it's certainly not as vehement a focus um, anymore. I think it's a huge market. So. Yeah, there are. Um, there's not any that are so sp focused on early stage technology. Um, so there's Biz by Cell. Um, there's, there's Flippa. Um, there's a few sites that you can sell businesses. This is probably the most kind of targeted for early stage technology transactions. Yes, sir. That's a good question. Patent trolls on there. I don't have a good sense of that. Um, I'd say my general sense is not a lot. I'd say more of what it is are kind of small private equity firms that are trying to put stuff together. Um, because we don't get into deal execution, we're, we're basically a finder connecting buyers and sellers. Um, we don't, I don't really surface which ones are those guys. Um, so. Yep. 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 Yeah, ex that is true. So we do have a lot of like private, small private equity firms with their associates just live in there and look at deals all day long. Um, the, the amount of information in the seller profile is up to the seller themselves. So what we ask for is company description, team, dis team highlights, um, lightweight financials, so revenue. Not, we don't audit any of this stuff, but financials, um, dollars raised, location, and basically kind of consider it a one-pager. Consider it like what would be in a one-pager for a company is what we're going to have on X around. It's what sparks the interest and what starts the conversation. If people do have patents, they don't detail them. They'll you know, enumerate them um, as kind of a teaser, but uh, there's, not, there's not a ton of detail in there. Mm -hmm. When it comes to IP acquisitions, how much of it is yep. the actual product and how much of it is the patent? You know, you know, yeah, IP acquisitions, we, we don't see a lot of them that are successful, frankly. Um, oftentimes, uh, and a lot of the buyers that we're working with are technology buyers. The, spe specifically in the Valley, there's a big not invented here problem. If, it's, if it wasn't built in, you know, in Mountain View, it's not gonna belong in Mountain View type thing. Um, when you get outside of tech, buyers outside of tech, they're more interested in doing those. Um, but generally, I, I'd say, probably of all of our deals, maybe there's may have been one IP deal out of the 90 that have happened. So there's not a lot of successful yeah, ones. IP, yeah, companies and yeah, there's, yeah, there's others exactly that are more focused on that. Um, and then Jonathan, you asked, I forget, this, you asked a more specific question about the deal transaction or... What's the actual product, like the physical product, like the product, like Yep. Um, typically it's for customers or revenue if it's an IP. I mean, in which case it's kind of not really IP or, or asset, but just selling straight up tech code is not a very big business. Unless maybe it's a patent portfolio and that's kind of a different situation. We don't really focus on that. Um, I'd say the, the more likely transactions are there's IP and there's people that know how to build it and integrate it and the two have to go together. Yes, sir. Two more, we've got one over here too. <laughs> Yep. We do n no filtering for that. That's a great question. So. Yeah, it's a seller. We're, we're again, we're focused on c connecting the two parties that are interested in having a conversation. Once we do that, we we step out. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. No, I love CB Insights. I think they're one of the best products out there. I've been trying to get their data for the past three and a half years. Anand, the CEO, won't give it to me, but um, he won't let us license it. It's fantastic. Uh, no, we don't see them as a competitor. Um, we see them as a great data source. We would use their data to pump into this to make our recommendations better. I think our unique focus is the intent 
that people have in this network. Um, and this is one of the reasons why we haven't branched out to be a business development network, is because when a buyer and a seller connect on here, it is instantly actionable. They can get down to meat and potatoes of a deal within that day or that week. Um, if you broaden it out to be more of a data service or more of a business development tool, the intent goes away and people fish and have coffee meetings and conversations. Um, for us getting paid on transaction, we need to focus on a higher level of intent. Um, so, but uh, no, I, I love CV Insights. All right, thank you.